Uh, I'm Jill Rutter. I am uh, our program director for what we call Better Policymaking in Institute for Government. And in a report we produced now two years ago, uh, we probably without thinking about it or really understanding what we meant, we said we thought that uh, insufficient attention in Whitehall was was uh, paid to the issue of actually designing policies that worked. So people tended to assume that there was just a sort of gap that you could just sort of randomly, uh, randomly have between policy concept and policy delivery. You didn't actually have to do any thinking about how your policy translated into what was experienced by citizens. And then you were no doubt slightly surprised by the outcomes that happened when, uh, when your fantastic grand scheme didn't quite turn out like you expected in practice. But anyway, we were also extraordinarily interested in two really innovative institutions, uh, MindLab in Denmark and Citra in Finland. So it's an enormous pleasure uh, that thanks to the Cabinet Office Open Policy team who are here in force today and thanks as well to the Design Commission at Policy Connect, we've been able to put on this event with Marco Steinberg. Marco is the Strategic Design Director at the Finnish Innovation Fund where he leads the Helsinki Design Lab. So he is the man you want to hear from. But he's also, I think, as far as I can see, designing himself out of business by deciding that these issues are now so mainstreamed in Finland that they're not needed anymore. So uh, in the UK, you just go on and on forever. But anyway, but, uh, but anyway so it's a fantastically good and timely opportunity to hear from Marco about the Helsinki Design Lab. So Marco has not sort of come to this through a desperate conventional route. He's actually an architect by training and then was professor at Harvard Design School, uh, but has spent a substantial amount of time at the Helsinki Design Lab. So what's going to happen now is Marco is going to do a presentation uh, for about 20 to 25 minutes. So we're trying to work out how long it should be because he does a pr different presentation to a design audience to a non-design audience. Uh, so I hope you've got something that works for everybody. Then we're going to open it up to questions, answers, discussion, Etc. And if you can't think of any questions, I will think of lots. Um, but I'm sure you can, so be thinking now what you want to do. So without further ado, Marco Stein. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to put my timer on. I'm not tweeting while I'm talking. Oh, by the way, if you want to tweet, live tweeting, hashtag open policy, and I think the username is IFG and the password is something <coughs> deeply hackable like visitor. But anyway, so, uh, so do go ahead and live tweet. There's already a lot of Twitter interest in this event. All right. Well, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you. And um, let me just turn this on. Um, and I will basically share what we've been doing. And um, I'll do lots of things I don't normally do. Um, I'll put a what the hell is he saying claim right <laughs> up front before I've established any credibility with you. Uh, and then hopefully I'll regrain some of that credibility as we go forward. Mm -hmm. And so the claim is I think we have the biggest project of our times in front of us and we can think about what that actually means. Um, I'll just throw some and you'll here I'll kind of put on display my sheer ignorance, both historical and other ignorance. But, uh, you know, we had the scientific revolution. That was a pretty interesting project. Uh, had very fundamental impact, so its size may have been thought of in terms of its impact. It probably, in terms of how many people were involved in that community, maybe not that great. Uh, but certainly we can see other things like the Industrial Revolution that came out, which you could think of as a kind of project. And then a project which I will talk about is going to the moon. <clears throat> so that was also a, a pretty massive project if you think of it, not just in terms of rethinking the principles of going somewhere, uh, but its geopolitical impact, uh, how it shaped uh, policy, uh, around the world, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a pretty big project. So let's see what this project is basically about. And, and I, uh, the argument I'm, I'm making here is that governments have huge challenges. Uh, and here I will start by offending people, and I probably continue doing this, that they're completely inequipped to deal with. And if they want to meet those innovation challenges, which are not about administering, are not about process improvement, are not about efficiency, but are actually about fundamentally rethinking. Uh, they're fundamentally about bringing strategic redesign, not just process improvement to the way that government behaves. And this is the big project uh, that we have on our hands. If we can do that, I believe a lot of other things will have a trickle-down effect on that. 
give you a little bit of background. Um, I work for the Finnish Innovation Fund called Citra, which is Suomenitsenai Suuden Juhla Rahasto, which means absolutely nothing to most of you. <laughs> but just to put it out there, uh, we're a very unique organization in terms of tools that governments usually have to innovate in the sense that we're both politically and financially independent. So we're not part of a ministry, so most innovation organizations may be under, say, the Ministry of Trade and Employment, meaning that when Minister X comes, innovation's that way, and four years later, innovation's that way. Um, and guess what? They have to go through policy uh, budget approval every year. So it means that in hard times, the stuff that's called innovation gets cut, and you have very short-term perspective on stuff. So we have an endowment, and we live off the interest of that, and that's basically how we survive, and that gives us our financial uh, independence. We report to Parliament, and we can take a long-term perspective on risk. I won't get into the history. We can chat about it if you want to know more later on about this. And I also want to talk about our team. We've had at its biggest a team of seven within an organization of 120. Uh, we are now down to a team of about uh, one and a half, two and a half, something like that. Depends how you count it. Uh, and as was alluded, we are on our way of actually moving forward. Uh, and we can come back to that in conversation if you're interested. Um, I want to take the concept because I know there's lab is something that's probably at least in some of your minds and, and put that a bit in context. When, when I came to the organization in 2008 and built this capability, uh, we had an initiative which was really a, a, an event called Helsinki Design Lab. And we were asked to figure out what this could be. So we inherited the term lab. Um, but what it became, it was the idea that there are strategic designers designed not to shape products, but designed to shape decision making. There are strategic design communities out there involved in social innovation um, efforts. Uh, they're very lonely, and there isn't a really codified practice. So can we build a platform that we help bring the community together, help codify the practice, and do some experimentation? So it's really an experimentation platform. We have other things like Low to Know, which was a development project we were involved in in downtown Helsinki, where our organization had assets tied to actually building, was an investor, where we applied some of these strategic design principles to rethinking how do you do zero carbon construction. All right? So this is an applied project. And we have Design Exchange, which is a project to actually place designers within the public sector. If the public sector owns huge challenges and doesn't have the innovation capability to meet them, how do we bring that capability? I'm not claiming that the word design is going to solve it all, but I think the word design has a place in this. And we don't think it can happen as a consultancy. There is no line item budget for crazy weird design stuff to be procured. There is no one who procures or anybody who advocates for this, broadly speaking. And we think change has to happen from within. So these people need to become members of the community, not just advising another community. So one is the innovation platform. We have projects like Low to No, Brickstarter, taking the idea of Kickstarter and applying it to how you build cities. Uh, and then Open Kitchen, how do you set up uh, a, a business, basically. I won't get into that, but we can talk if you want later. But we have innovation platform, applied projects, and capability building. And I think for me, the idea, if you build a lab, has to incorporate those things. It can't be just academic, it can't just be the practicalities of the project, and it can't be those devoid of any capability of delivering it. All right, so let's go on. I got quite a bit of slides, I'm gonna run quite quickly. I'll skip every other word. All right, so we, we have crisis. This is kind of what I alluded to already before, and you could pick any kind of topic you want, right? Um, climate change, social inequality, financial systems, education, well-being, these are actually all highly interconnected. We're not built to do this. Governments are highly siloed around these issues. Um, and it's not like we don't know that there's challenges. It's not like people aren't aware that healthcare is, needs some form of reform or improvement. It's just that fundamentally, we actually don't know what the deep root questions are. Right? And so, not to blame people, but just to bring people who represent the challenge. And I don't want to talk about these people in terms of their political disposition or that they represent an ideology, but really represent the roles that the, our states are built with. So I'm gonna oversimplify. Many of you in the audience are much more well-versed, so this will sound kind of naive. You basically have a group of people, politicians, that are charged with creating visions. What is the vision of a better country? And then you have a group of people, public servants, who are charged with technically delivering that. And it's the interaction between these two that helps create 
the state that helps create the public sector, et cetera, et cetera. And I would say that this model is deeply flawed. Unfortunately, in 2008, when Bush came out and talked about the subprime crisis for the first time in public, his first words were, it turns out, and I've said this frequently, mm. the man at the top of the pyramid was not aware. Mm. Right? So somehow, in that strategic perspective, the idea that something in the financial sector could affect people and could affect other things and the interconnected nature of these problems was not really in the kind of dominant culture, the way that people perceive things. And likewise, Greenspan, who was by most people considered a monetary genius, he understood that there was a system out there. The, the challenge was that he had built a model that was flawed. And he had data for 40 years to suggest that what they were doing was correct only to wake up one day to see that it's deeply flawed. So as smart people, as individuals that can rationalize things, our biggest danger, which is also our greatest asset, but the danger is that you can rationalize anything, however flawed it may be. And this idea that you can disconnect this bit with that bit and disconnect this bit with the delivery end of things is what I think is flawed. So I, I'm telling a story that I tell frequently, so forgive me, but it, I think it helps us have a shared uh, sort of reference. And I take you back to uh, Denmark in the 1950s. And uh, it, it, a small town was very concerned that people weren't going to the swimming facility anymore. The public wasn't going to the public swimming facility. Why? So city council went to visit, and what they found was a building in terrible, deplorable conditions. And it was clear to everybody what we needed was a new building. So they hired an architect, and an architect came to a meeting, uh, two weeks later, and city council was waiting for the first sketch. What would the shape of that new solution look like? And he showed a bus schedule, right? Something that looks like this. And he said, you know, your problem is not the building. The problem is you changed the public bus schedule last year not to coincide with open hours. People can't get to the place. It's not that the place is not functioning. And this is the problem, is that there is one organization that owns the bus schedule, and there's another organization that owns the facility, and they're driven by different incentives and different cultures, and any innovation that's going to happen that considers the intersection of these things is going to happen in spite of our institutions, not because of our institutions. So we like to talk about, if you're going to be strategic, define what is the architecture of the problem. How are the different things connected to each other that can lead you to the architecture of a solution that can figure, help you figure out what kinds of services, what kinds of things you need to actually start focusing on. So this is a simple chart that I use frequently to describe the process of going from you know there's an issue to providing a solution. Policy tries to figure this out to some degree. Right? And as a designer, I've worked at this end, meaning I wait for people to give me a brief. And that brief is frequently a swimming facility. And as I frequently said, I can put lipstick on a pig, right? or I can work upstream. And I can actually get to all the other issues that seem external to the problem itself to understand how they're influencing the problem. This is, I would say, product or service design. This is strategic design over here. We need these as complementary aspects. I'm not talking about one thing doing away with something else. I'm talking they need to work in complement. If we just do this, and in Finland this has become quite in vogue, mm -hmm. service design. The big, big problem is we will help improve the wrong services. Dying will just be a little more pleasant. <laughs> so we need to do this, and we need to ask ourselves, uh, is dying the right solution? Is there a question that we're not asking? If we only do that, we'll have fantastic theoretical models that have no impact on people. So we need to do both of those. All right, so I want to get into a project that shows how we have actually then taken the idea of an architecture of a problem and delivered it in the project. So this is the development project I mentioned briefly, low to no. Its objective was to create a market that does not exist in Finland, which is a sustainable development market. Zero carbon development. How do you do that? We had a, uh, a site in, in, in Helsinki, and we were given a block, and we worked with two developers uh, in partnership. All three of us, us and the two developers, uh, shared investors uh, in a block that had housing, uh, but that had offices, retail, and other aspects in there. All right, and we knew if you want to get to zero carbon as a development objective, it's not just about the building. It's not just about energy efficiency. It's not just uh, about planning and transportation. The example I always use is, uh, yes, I can have zero energy homes. That's great. But if they're planned far from work, I'll undermine any benefit I accrue at the building level through added transportation. So architecture, energy policy, uh, planning need to be highly integrated. And as I always use, and forgive me, but if I eat five kilos of Brazilian meat a day, I will just be carbon shifting somewhere else. 
right? It's like cost shifting. I'm just passing the problem somewhere else. So if we really want to understand what zero carbon is, we need to integrate these. These are different ministries. These are different departments. These are different specialties. These are different professions. And as much as we like to talk about interdisciplinary work, the challenge of making this happen is huge, and it's ultimately a cultural challenge. And what it did is ultimately a block that we've been working on that ties energy policy questions to rethinking mobility, to rethinking building codes around materials and embodied energy, new services, et cetera, et cetera. It's connecting all of that. And here are just some examples I won't get into, but on the service end, we have things like new uh, low carbon or zero kilometer food, uh, eco laundry services, bicycle to help provide alternative transportation modes as seamlessly and easily as possible, all the way to taking all the saunas out of apartments, so you'd have 200 saunas in this block, to having one public sauna. So the energy equation makes sense. You have one sauna day on instead of 200, and you do another thing is which you bring social resilience back. The fact that people would bathe on their own and is being flipped to bathing together has both an energy but also a social component to it. I meet you, and believe me, when you meet people naked, it just really lowers the barrier to things. <laughs> so yes, I meet you, and I'm more likely to share things with you, and I'm probably more likely to keep in touch with you and, and, and keep an eye and see if you're doing fine or if you need help. Make it socially more resilient. I won't get into some of the interface issues because we don't have time, but there's a whole service a design interface aspect to this that needs to be integrated to this. And yes, we do a building. I'm an architect by training. But actually, what we need to do is figure out what's the architecture of that solution. We had to change fire codes to allow new kinds of low carbon materials to be eligible for buildings. We need to change the investment logics. We had to bring smart interfaces so citizens can make informed decisions about carbon, et cetera, et cetera. And who's doing this? No one's doing this kind of work. Different departments, different ministries are owning little bits. Mm -hmm. And while there may be great innovation on these individual topics, there is no innovation on the whole. In the US, there's more innovation you can believe in healthcare, but healthcare is not being innovated because they don't create positive sum. So what kind of innovation are we talking about? Because this gets kind of confused. While there's this kind of innovation, it's crossing the street, right? We're not talking about crossing the street. Yes, I think we know how to cross the street. We can probably perfect. It's probably about adapting things, and the distance is not that great. We're talking about this kind of innovation, going to the moon for the first time, where there was nothing you could replicate. No one knew how to do it, and you couldn't just adapt what you had. You had to rethink basic principles. And by going to such an extreme place, and by rethinking things, there's a tremendous trickle-down effect. But you need to think, what kind of people do you need for this? If it's about crossing the street, you need different kinds of innovators that are probably quite precise and know how crossing the street happens and how you might work within the given knowns. And if you need to go to the moon, you probably need people who are willing to re-question everything and actually don't care how a horse or a car moves because they know that they're not going to figure this out by improving on that. So you need very different kinds of people. So you need to think about what is our innovation challenge and are we resourcing from a people perspective. You need very different kind of leadership. Leadership that is able to navigate a much higher degree of uncertainty. Uh, there's a political aspect to this. The kinds of risks associating with doing things that we don't know and we can't guarantee that are gonna happen. Culture, you need a very different kinds. You need different kind of trust involved in here. Uh, resourcing, the thing that I love is people wanna go to the moon but they wanna know how you're gonna do it on what schedule, how much it's going to cost, and they want an uh, item-by-item workflow on this thing. Well, guess what? If I've never done it before, the thing I'm going to put in front of you is an educated guess at best. And this is my big quest, is to find out the first budget for going to the moon and see how close we came to it. Right? So it's not about replicating things. It's not about imitating things where you have a benchmark you can work on. It's actually about innovating uh, and inventing. Incentives, same thing. Uh, when I was teaching at Harvard, there is a lot about let's work together, but guess what? The incentives in the schools are about promotion within the schools. So when we did healthcare work that involved design and medical and public health and policy all together, I would go to my dean and they would say, that's great, but that's not design. And my medical colleague would go to his dean and say, that's fantastic, but that's not medicine. And no one wants to get, no one gets promoted. So the incentives are not aligned with the nature of the mission. Relationships, 
I could go on and on and on. So the challenge is, is we think too generically about what the innovation mission is that we have, and then we put the wrong people with the wrong resourcing, with the wrong incentives, and we hope that something happens with it. And one of the things we need to break is actually these uh, oppositional ideas that are actually deeply embedded in the way that we work. We plan, and then when we figured it all out, we implement. Well, guess what? If you had to do that to go into the moon, the first rocket would just explode, right? <laughs> so what you actually need to do is work much more iteratively, begin to try out aspects of this, and become smarter. So this has to be much more iterative. Top down to bottom up. It's not working very well in the way we build communities, right? We need to understand this in a different relationship. So what we like to think is you work simultaneously. And this challenges the way organizations have worked. The team that only does planning and the team that only does delivery, you can't separate those two. Actually, a team that plans has to deliver so they understand what are the opportunities and realities and barriers so they can plan better and vice versa. So I would say we need to move here. But we can't shut government down for 10 years as we say, oops, we got it all wrong and we're going to build perfect government right now. We need to actually change the tire on the car while we're driving. This is our challenge. So figure out what the innovation mission is, how are you going to resource it, and then figure out how you're going to change that tire while you're driving. <laughs> so I have three oversimplified ideas for you, and I hope I'll be done soon. Okay, one is we believe very much in the power of projects. So as I said, these are oversimplified statements, but to provoke a little bit. So to take that even further, I would say, let's not change organizations and hope that they deliver better. Let's start by doing better and helping organize organizations around those principles. How can we do more of that? And what's great about projects is that as people from different backgrounds share experiences, they build shared culture, shared language, shared understanding, and a shared understanding of how idea and reality connect. Sometimes the perceived risk, the reason why we don't do things, is exaggerated. Sometimes it's underestimated. And it's only by connecting the two that you can do. So lead with projects. You build a new culture. The second is M&A, mergers and acquisitions. So think about how innovation happens in the business world. At the bigger you get, the slower you get. Harvard's a very big university. I fear it may not be that innovative. I know I'm offending a lot of people, including myself. <laughs> so, but that's because when you're successful at something, that really hinders your ability to rethink what success is actually going forward. And it may be very different. So what big businesses do is they find small companies where innovation's easier. There aren't as much legacy. There isn't as much barriers or so on to do. And they acquire them. They bring innovation from inside. So could government do that as really innovative ways of working happen freed of the bigness of government, that they actually reel it in and make it part of government? It's kind of the opposite of, I think, what's happening around at least Europe. And DMZ, the, the militarized military zones, right? When you have things that are in opposition to each other and you want a new logic to enter, you can create a free space that's free from the dominant culture. We're very much caught in the public sector in a dominant culture, a way of behaving, a way of acting, concepts, models, rules, regulations, behaviors. We need to create a free space where new behaviors can emerge. So I think this is the third kind of concept I want to throw out to you. And a question for this kind of design, should it happen outside government, in the heart of government, or in between? And we land in in between. If you put it outside, it's not going to be useful. Right? Oh, hello, I'm, I'm advising you. Right? No. If you put it in the middle, the mainstream is going to crush it. So to have the freedom to actually see things from outside and see things from inside simultaneously, I think, is the way to go. All right, so we built Helsinki Design Lab. I realize I have four more minutes. I'll use three, perhaps. So Helsinki Design Lab, as I said, was one of a coordinated set of things that for us would create the broader idea of a lab. It's not the lab itself. It's an innovation platform. So what do we do? We take large-scale challenges that we believe are at the core of the competitiveness of a community. In this case, we ran three studios in 2010 around the idea of what are the questions that are at the heart of Finnish competitiveness. So one of them, believe it or not, is education. Okay? I'll take my perspective, and again, I'm offending a big portion of my country, is saying while we have, by many standards, a great education system, maybe we have perfected yesterday's solution. And by virtue of that, we'll be the last to improve tomorrow's solution. So could we rethink what education in this day and tomorrow looks like, and what are those principles? The other question we put on the table was aging. After Japan, we're the second aging uh, country in the world. How would you rethink this question, and what are the opportunities 
uh, around it. And the third was making Finland carbon neutral from a development perspective. What would that actually mean? All right, so what do we do? How do we run these sessions? Well, one is you got to have a really good brief. You got to really have a good entry point into the problem, as many kinds of facts from a 360 degree perspective, as many voices there. You get a really holistic, shared platform to begin to do your design bit. So we spend here six months writing these briefs that were then given to a team that we selected, and we like to work in teams of eight. Eight, we think, is a good number to do deep, truly collaborative work. Yes, we can bring 800 people. That's a different form of collaboration that has value elsewhere, but not for this kind of initiative. And they represent a Noah's Ark. We know that to solve these issues, you need many different perspectives. What are the representative animals, because you can't bring all the perspectives that you need around the table. And we have two designers, not to facilitate, not to moderate, yes, they do that too, but to bring synthesis. How do you bring things that are disparate, and how do you create a coherent whole out of those disparate inputs on it? So design lead, eight people, six of them are outsiders, because when outsiders come, they ask all the wrong questions. They touch all the taboos. If I put eight fins in the room, we'll all talk about the same thing. But if I have six foreigners, they'll say, well, why do you do that? And why do you do And we do this. And suddenly there's a conversation you've never had. They have a week, and they get immersed into the system. So this is our sustainable development team. I won't get into it, but you can say hi. Uh, our education team, likewise. And uh, our aging team, just to give you an example, if you're doing something on aging, guess what? You need your health economist to have any bit of credibility. So Alberto Holly over here from Lausanne, fantastic person. But you also need your doctor, so John Rourke over here, right? he's the doctor. Mm -hmm. But we chose him also because he is an expert in the ethics of dying. As the public sector has less and less mm -hmm. resources because we have fewer and fewer taxpayers mm -hmm. and more need for mm -hmm. elderly services, we're going to come to deeply ethical questions. What point do we not have resources to deal with this issue? These are not technical questions. So finding the right kind of people that can work collaboratively in a deep session to actually redesign principles is quite important. And on day one, what do they do? Day one is an immersion into what is the current thinking about the issue. They meet with the minister, and they hear the minister's perspective on the issue, and other experts. It's the theory day. And on day two is the practice day. That means they do light ethnography, they go in the field, and actually realize how messy and dirty these issues are. And because they're good observers, they are with kids, with parents, with teachers, different kinds of people, and they begin to observe different things new questions arise. And they end the week with a policy conversation that's much more like a design review. They put the work up, and they have to deliver two things. What is your roadmap for strategic improvements? We are not interested in how would you bring greater efficiency to the current way of doing, but actually how would you rethink from the ground up what this thing ought to be? And then what are the top 10 things you can do right now to get us closer to it? Not to solve it, because that can be too big, but what are the first things you need to do? And this is a conversation that most policy people don't have in this format. And one of the comments we had, I can't believe you, you, you did it in a week. In the US, there was a butter called. I can't believe it's not butter. <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, I can't story. believe you did it in a week, right? And, and, and this was from a top, top, top person in, in, in public office. And what he was saying is, look, around some of these themes, we have big committees that have worked years on these issues. And that's the problem. Is they work many years, they use all of the political capital just to drive the process, and they have no more capital left to actually do anything afterwards. The political cycle's over, and they got to a fraction of the op understanding of, that you did. So how do you accelerate the cycle so it's much more at the pace of life, at the pace of cycles of political and other that need to happen? And then we end these sessions by migrating. You can see the work on the wall, the conversation we had in the same space with dinner. Because guess what? When I have dinner and a glass of water, wine, I'm more likely to socialize with you as a person than as an institution. And you have those what-if conversations here that you usually don't have in a formal setting. And then we take these to more formal kinds of conversations and begin to grow that opportunity out. We try to codify the practices. So we have a book that how do you set up a studio like this. And we try to think about how do you do this kind of thing. So if you want to do more of this, and I'll end on this capability question, is do you build capability from the outside and as a consultant sell it? As, as you can tell, I, I don't think that's going to work, at least in this phase of development. It may work later on, and maybe hybrid solutions will work. But we really believe you need to bring this design work from within. You need to change the culture of these organizations. So I'll end on this. Design exchange, placing designers in the public sector. 
These are our partners. And I'll tell two very quick stories. This is Jana from Social Services. Okay? So Jana uh, started working in social services last August, and she honed in very quickly on a challenge um, that was around families with children, and the ones that are at greatest risk are the ones that are having the hardest time getting the help they need. And so this is a scenario I always picture, uh, paint for everybody. So forgive me if you heard this. So I'm a young father. I got a two-year-old daughter. It's 2 a.m. in the morning. My daughter's crying. What do I do? I go online. And social services, and what do I get? I get a website that tells me how they're organized. Do I care? No, I do not care. I need the quickest link to the service that I need. So what we did was, let's flip that logic. Let's actually make it more like Google. And in fact, there are many people in this room that we've been inspired by, people at GDS and so on, that I think we've learned a lot. And by flipping that, 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 that logic, you begin to, there's a trickle down effect that's I, th I think quite interesting. Okay? So a couple things about this. So one is our competition was Google in this sense. Right? And um, uh, we needed uh, the clearest path. And this is what the first prototype looked like. Okay? I, you don't have to go, ooh, wow, because it's not that ooh, wow. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> All right? So there's a general number over here. Uh, you can actually put your, the area you live in, and it'll tell you the person available right now, his name and phone number. Right? And there's other functionality we had here. You could see whether they're actually online or not online and their photo and so on and so on and other things. But very basic to get going very quickly and get the flow going, get this recognized, and begin to learn what actually works. What's the logic we need to adapt to, not assume people adapt to our logic. Okay? So this was publicly procured in four days, and the service was launched in two weeks. And I would challenge any corporation coming up with a new business decision in four days and launching a new product or service in two weeks. It just doesn't happen. So I think we need to also think of the public sector as a huge opportunity to innovate uh, if it has the right kinds of smarts in there. And then when you do this, you begin to get feedback about what actually is the logic you need to adapt to. And when you get more success, and I can't say we've had huge success yet because it's still something quite, and I won't get into it, we can talk more where we are with this. Um, but it begins to put pressure on the organization to organize themselves along this logic. Because the organization says, this is working, it's faster, it's cheaper, it's better. Let's start organizing this way. So rather than say, let's reorganize Helsinki Social Department or any other department, you pick your name, and hope they can do more of this, uh, let's start doing this. And then there is experience and knowledge about how you could do more of that. Sara. And I'm going to end, I really promise. Okay, okay so Sara went uh, to another place in Lahti, north of Helsinki, about 100 kilometers, community of about 120,000 people, into uh, city planning. And so what city planning is in Finland and elsewhere in the world is mostly this. This is how we reconcile the top-down desire to implement the great idea and the bottom-up desire to have a different vision of the world. And so this is a famous photograph of how that gets reconciled. Not very well, right? Mm -hmm. So, and what's happening with master planning in cities is in Finland, they're going more and more frequently to court, which is very expensive, not a good use of your tax euros, and a terrible way of building communities. So could we actually co-create with citizens? This doesn't mean, uh, and people are like, oh, okay, everyone's a designer, uh, or everyone's a planner now. No, it's the recognition that there's different kind of expertise, which is different from being expert. Expertise that is necessary in the process to actually understand what are the right simplifiers, what are the right forms that actually best bring this all together. So co-create means the brief for the master plan is done with citizens, their input about how they see how they use the city. It's not designed by them, but it has that expertise embedded in it. And what we ended up doing was actually having a process that was faster, cheaper, and better. Here is Sara working with kids. You ask yourself, why kids? Because she engaged in all kinds of communities, over 1,000 people in different formats and different tools. And kids, yes, because the this is the nice story. They're the future of the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are that too. But the kids also go home, and they have very interesting conversations with their parents about the city. And it's a great way to engage their parents. It's a better way sometimes than sending a form from the city asking parents what they want because it helps show the oppositional nature of it rather than the engaged nature of what it could be. And we said, just like the website, don't assume that people are going to come to your office to talk about the city. You go where people are. So we set up, there's once a month a market in Lahti where everybody comes, so you're going to be part of the market. And they set up a stand in the marketplace. They had games. This is a game here about how to plan 
So you're planning, and then you get rejected, and then you get planned, and then you get rejected, and then you go to court, and then you get, and when you play this game, it lowers the barrier to engage people. And these are city planners over here, and they could not believe it. For 30 years, some of these people had thought of citizens as urputtaya, which is complainers. <laughs> because you know what? In public service, we only have the complaint box. We don't have the good ideas box. Mm -hmm. So they realize, actually, that these people have a lot of very constructive ideas, and vice versa. So anyhow, you go and change the logic. So I'll end on this. I think there's a real urgency to act. What is the timeline on some of the issues that we need to innovate on? I'll just throw out, just to be provocative, what happens if in 10 years it costs a year's salary to fill up your gas your car with gas? Means we would need, on the issue of carbon and oil and all of the things associated, innovate really, really rapidly. And what is the clock speed by which things happen in an evolutionary manner? I think this is way tight, and I don't think the clock speed that things will normally happen is fast enough. All right. Thank you very much. This was my cash last year. <laughs>Wow, well, we'll let Marco catch his breath. Of course, none of this applies here because we don't have any problems in things like planning or any of these sorts of problems. And actually, delivering sustainable development in the UK, which I used to be normally responsible for, that's a piece of cake as well. So, anyway, but conversely, there may be some things we can learn. So, I'm sure there are a million and one questions out there. So, why don't we take a sort of bunch of, say, three or so? If you're in the innovation room and you want to ask a question, you have to. Uh, duck into this room and then we can identify. Are they much more innovative over there? We'll see. Yeah. We'll see if any of them come in. <laughs> we were just sitting there going, ah, oh, what was all that? Anyway, any questions? I can't believe. Yes, there in the corner. Um, yeah, could you wait for the mic and just tell us who you are very quickly because then we'll do it. Hi, um, Andrea Siodmok. Uh, it's a fantastic talk, so thank you. Um, my question, I suppose, is about innovation in, in local government, which is the area I know best. And um, one of the challenges I see is the sort of accountability of local government. So if you set up a peer-to-peer -peer service for citizens to give each other's lifts, um, then there's a different kind of accountability in, of trust between those services, those kind of outside-the-system services. When a local authority sets up a transport solution, they're bound within lots of rules and regulations. So is there anything that you found that, um, if you like, help institutions to tackle those built-in barriers around the kind of rules that they have to follow? Okay, let's hold that on. Any other questions? Yes. I'm emerging from the innovation room. John T. Uh, hello, I'm John T. Olive Cooper. Hi, Marco. Hi. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do a lot here in the UK over the last couple of years is uh, broaden out the type of actors who work on public services, and we now do a lot with charities, social enterprises, private organisations. Um, have you thought much about how both independent provision but also independent financing, social financing, interacts with this kind of world? And do you have any experience of that from either Harvard or, or Finland? Okay, and any... One more quickly, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Fantastic talk. Michael Thompson. Uh, Marco, you talked about dominant culture, and in a sense, you're wanting to make change to dominant culture, but actually what perhaps you're wanting underneath is a different culture that is also dominant. Um, so <laughs> it's just that we've got the wrong dominant culture. So I'm just wondering, are there little Trojan ponies? How do we find people like you to create the changes from within that we want? Because it's, it's a very complex issue, isn't it? And it's very difficult for people operating in very constrained silos and so on uh, to be able to make the changes that we'd like to see. Thank you. Right. Go Should I give it a little yeah, stab? No. And then forgive me if I A, m misunderstood no. or forgot. And you, you, you guys can keep me in check. I can't um, get a clarification. It's <coughs> even more confusing there. So if I understood correctly, the first question, uh, nice yeah, to okay. see you again, yeah. by the way, um, is, uh, this kind of maybe responsibility question, and uh, let me maybe spin it in my own way. When we were setting up the social service project, um, you know, we had a tremendous advocate, which was the director of the whole department. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, these questions come down also to just questions of sheer leadership. Everything you're going to do has risk associated. There is a small risk that a meteor is going to hit this building right now, and we'll all perish. 
that risk is probably quite small compared to others. So this idea that there are things that are risky and ideas that are not risky is kind of flawed. Uh, and so sometimes it's just having the kind of leadership to understand what's at play and what needs to happen. And his view was, which I would share very much, is, um, you know, I have a lot of lawyer friends, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he's got a lot of lawyers uh, in, in his organization that are reminding him all the time about all the risks around things. And it's come to the point where the public sector can't do anything because there's always some risk deviating from the known, where you have risks, but the risks are known, to going to the unknown risks. And frequently, what you don't know is perceived to be bigger than what you know, and you'd rather have what you know. Uh, and it's a leadership question. You, you, you just need to say that, no, I'm sorry. And his, his kind of perspective on that was, there's a risk of not innovating that is far bigger than the risks of doing something and failing on it. And that's actually becoming far bigger than the kind of associated risks. Uh, we have an obligation. And if we're not meeting that obligation, no, you know, we're not kind of, and, and, and there is a risk right. going further down, which is kind of shifting things in time, mm -hmm. that we'll have great social instability. <clears throat> That's probably not being factored into the risk equation. The risk equation is like this. And so we'll keep sustaining the current path until we come to a moment where, I don't know, a revolution is the only way mm. that things can actually change, which is a very destructive mm. uh, way and to one do of this. The, one of the things the UK, <laughs> certainly the UK civil service is accused of being is very risk averse, and that there's a, sort of quite a big price attached to being associated with a failure, but actually sort of not trying something, there's actually no price attached. Yep. So we have a sort of mentality, and that applies to some pol politicians too. Have you managed to escape that sort of culture where a legitimate attempt that fails is actually regarded as a good thing to have done rather than mm -hmm. you know, a banner headline of you know, ex-council wastes money on flawed scheme? So, so uh, I don't have a clear answer, but I have a, an idea I'll share mm -hmm. with you, which is uh, there's all kinds of people, luckily. Uh, there's all kinds of organizations, all kinds of contexts, and broadly speaking, we can say they fall amongst the kind of mm. Gaussian curve, mm. right? There's some early adopters, some laggers, and so on and so on. It's being very mm. smart where mm. you, uh, in a way, attack this. So connecting it maybe to Michael's mm. question about mm. dominant culture, mm. does it make sense to go to the middle of the culture mm. or to go to the lagging part mm. of the culture? Mm, probably not. Uh, there's a lot of really innovative people in public mm. service. Don't get me wrong. Mm. You know, there's, I have mm. fabulous people in there, and a lot of them are actually kind of bound and constricted. Mm. There are advocates for a different way. So if you can help create enough space, uh, help mm. de-risk things mm. to a certain degree, you can help success happen mm. more quickly. You can also choose issues that are more likely to succeed. So for example, when I was at Harvard, we worked on healthcare. And you know, it's one thing when we talk about social mm. innovation to innovate on how the, uh, I don't know, uh, neighborhood garden gets developed versus innovating brain surgery, right? Uh, there are people's lives at stake in one challenge, and yes, we need to be cognizant of that, versus a more of a quality improvement kind of issue. So maybe if you're trying to bring a different culture, you demonstrate it where there are less associated risks, and then migrate it to the ones that have higher associated risks to it. So from a kind of systems perspective, you need to be kind of smart about that. So who are your leading places? What are the communities that might be leading communities? They may be underprivileged communities, that are being ignored and most likely to want to engage a different way of doing? Mm -hmm. And can you tackle a problem that is maybe not about life and death right mm -hmm. now, but migrate to it? So we come to Jonty's question, which is about sort of social, I mean, one of the things obviously about the UK at the moment is there is not much money around. So, uh, so we're sort of outsourcing both innovation and the financing of that innovation to non-government players. One of the interesting things about Citra is that you have this very substantial endowment started off as a venture capital firm. I wonder whether that sort of puts you in a different position to have to rely on private people to bring money to the table. Um, to it it, it is certainly an asset for us in that the sense we can identify things that we believe need to be done, experiments, risks that we believe need to be done, and not worry to the same degree about how do you resource it. I mean, we do have to worry very deeply that what we're doing aren't just uh, demonstrations that exist out of sheer unique circumstance and hence when we pull out, this thing will die. Uh, we need to actually plan quite strategically how we can de-risk other people adopting and realizing, hey, that wasn't that difficult. Uh, or now we know how to do it and we can take that on. So yes, that, that kind of helps uh, to some degree. Um, there's tons of money, actually. There, there, there's an abundance of money out there. 
uh, there is so much money, and there is, you know, as, as mm. a, a good colleague of mine from the LSC says, mm. uh, Dimitri uh, would say, there is more money parked in, in the wrong places today than ever before. Uh, because people are so risk adverse mm. to putting money in municipal bonds that are uh, giving you negative return. Mm. Uh, it's just that people don't know where to put their money. Uh, we have money in government in the wrong categories, helping maybe sustain things that have to need to be rethought. So it's actually figuring out how you make those transitions. So when I worked at Harvard on this healthcare mm. project, we got a philanthropy to give us a gift, mm. uh, which is fantastic. Because when you get gifts, there are no strings attached. You can go to the moon without telling them exactly what's going to happen, which is different from maybe other granting. So mm. you have to think about how that happens. Mm. I think you need to also consciously build those investment communities mm. and not, not hope that those investment communities will just come out of sheer uh, need and that means coordinating things. Mm -hmm. So maybe my last thought mm -hmm. on this before I suck all the air mm -hmm. out is um, there is a lot of very conservative money out there and, and it can be directed to things that are quite conservative and necessary to happen. We probably still need roads. That's a pretty conservative kind of thing, right? Uh, and there's money out there that is uh, mission driven. Uh, there are things like impact investment mm -hmm. where people are trying to figure out how you align these things. How do you begin to coordinate these? So some money can take risk out, other money can take the bulk of the known, uh, some other money can make, uh, create a market, so you have more. This is a big, big, big uh, design project, in my mind, around investment. Okay, let's go see any more points. Yes, in the front here. Thanks, uh, Dan Lockton. Um, thanks, Mark, it was really interesting. The, the, one of the questions I suppose I have is a lot of the things you've developed like the um the you know redesigned interface for the uh, social services website and so on they're almost kind of prototypes that you've put out in action to see what happens with them i how do you deal with with the kind of questions over like is it fair to be introducing essentially better services for some people um as an experiment in a, in a way because i can imagine in this country we, we would get people complaining that some areas have got this new service that's been introduced and is it not fair you know why is money being spent on them in a different way and i don't know how is that a problem in Finland, or do people accept it better as like, you know, this, this could lead to something better for everyone? I, I actually don't know if we, we accept it better. We are a country that doesn't talk, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I haven't heard that yet. But, um, I, and in a certain way, you could argue that in Finland it's more of a problem. We, we in, the, in the Nordic countries, have a very egalitarian model, which has tons of benefits. The downside is, is we don't tolerate differences. So we immediately get, you know, well, why are they getting, you know, and we're getting that. Um, I, I think it goes back to a question of leadership to some degree. Um, is it better that everybody has the bad service or that there's an attempt to actually improve services? Um, so I think that's a kind of very basic thing. Um, and, and going back to the first question about uh, sort of risks and, and liabilities with things that are new, yeah, it may be better, but it may actually kill you too. And, and, and it's not like we're switching off the mainstream service. What we're doing is we're saying there's this alternative one it's a beta thing. If you want to try it, like with beta stuff, be aware, blah, 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 may happen to you. But we would really appreciate it because it will help us create the next version of this, right? So it's not so either or in my mind. There's an, an aspect about uh, leadership and, and po political will. And then there's an aspect here, I think, about how does the strategies by which you mitigate difference and risk that I think is very important. So, Marco, if I'm sitting in a department mm -hmm. and your team of brilliant people, they've had their six month brief, then we've got these eight experts from around the world come in and drill down, meet people and think briefly, and you've got the, how do those people do it in a week? The sort of counterpart that people might see here is, but you guys who are supposed to be thinking about this have taken years and not got anywhere. So I'm just quite interested, how do you actually get buy-in to this process from both the sort of political leaders who say, well, aren't I elected? to do this, and I came in with my stuff that I want to do, but also from the sort of civil servants who are sort of doing the day job and may feel that all the interesting bits of their work have been delegated mm -hmm. out to you and to uh, you know, six non-Finnish experts yep. and a couple of Finns. So how do you actually get that sort of degree of degree of buy-in, or is there some resistance in the system to this? Well, I, I would say honestly that we're still figuring this out. Um, I think there's some principles that w at least I learned, our team mm. learned when we were doing stuff at Harvard and the experiences mm. after that, is um, don't, don't create great ideas and then go tell people. 
Uh, don't create great ideas and then try to knock on people's door to get them engaged. Actually, the great ideas are our shared ideas that we need to do. So uh, part of this is actually how do you engage? You know, we talk about engagement. Everybody thinks it's always like, ooh, we'll crowdsource, we'll just throw mm. something. No, sometimes it's actually just being human beings mm. and saying we're working on something that we recognize you have a great degree mm. of expertise and actually appreciating and valuing that expertise and saying we're willing to go on a journey with you to figure out if we can leverage your expertise mm. with other expertise and figure out if there's a better mm. overall solution. So to some degree, you need to have a kind of yes mm. uh, to that. Yeah. Uh, so the brief writing takes a long time because we're actually trying to learn from them. So you're flipping yeah. it around. It's not like we've learned something, now we're gonna come tell you. It's actually, we've spent six months with you and now we've learned yeah. a whole bunch of stuff, thanks, and we're gonna prepare this and it's just a week, right? And the great thing about a week is the expectations are low. So people are much more willing to entertain the opportunities than downplay, well, why isn't it technically we have so sophisticated? Because they realize a week's not. So the week plays to your advantage. And we end this six months relationship by having a strategic conversation. What if? Look, now we have a Noah's Ark of different kinds of NGOs and different ministry representatives and investors and innovation organizations. What can we do given the shared conversation we have? So it's about defining a shared project that has mm. different phases. There's a phase when mm. we leave, and mm. there's a phase we come back, and mm. there's a phase we have wine together. Okay, let's have some more questions. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so my name's Emma. I'm uh, leading an innovation unit within local government at the moment, which is interesting. And your point towards tackling small problems um, seems really key. Last week was all about the stationary cupboard and how you can innovate in the stationary cupboard, but it, okay. it actually was a mirror of how do you innovate in adult social care. Um, I wondered, what I've noticed is that you can't take people with you if the vision that you're both heading for isn't clear, and we've ended up doing quite a lot of work around, so what is the future of government and what is the future of this service and how can we articulate it together and realising there's a, a real disparate gap there and I wondered if you did any work around that sort of saying what does the government in 2030 look like and are we talking about the same thing? Um, I mean we don't know what the government's going to look like in 2013. Uh, we know what things look like now and we are in the way that we behave maybe a couple he mm. uh, hundred years behind mm. the curve. So I think there's already a huge advantage in actually getting that up. We know some of the key issues that are gonna drive and determine our future. There are a lot of things that we're locking in that even if we become smarter mm -hmm. in 30 years, it'll be too late to undo those. There are infrastructure decisions, there are energy decisions, there are uh, b community building decisions, investment, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So there's actually stuff that we don't need to look too far that we actually need to solve right now. Going back to the cupboard and the project thing, uh, why we think projects are a very valuable way to create this kind of change is by nature they're going to have to have some very clear boundaries on them. They're going to be quite discreet. What you need to be really smart about is how do I innovate the cupboard uh, in a way that allows me to eventually innovate, I don't know, uh, office culture, right? Uh, you can't go for office culture. It's too big. You have too many people you have to get on board. It's too amorphous and so on. But you have to have some idea of how this very discrete thing can help you actually address that. And that's when it becomes really strategic. Otherwise, we have, you know, a great websites and we have uh, great cupboards, but no positive sum innovation. So if we're looking at some of the sort of concrete consequences of some of the things you've done, sort of, you know, say your sustainable development project and we... You know, sat around, you know, compared with what we did here, I used to be on the community and local government working group on the code for sustainable homes, so between government departments and one or two people actually built things, we all sat around and wrote some rules and then sort of promulgated them out, but then nobody bothered to monitor take up and nobody put in place any incentives to take up and probably there's not very much take up, I mean, that seems like a reasonable guess, someone of the CLG will probably say that's wrong, but actually when you did your demonstration project of what a really sustainable development community looks like. What then happens to take that beyond mm -hmm. sort of one block okay. in downtown Helsinki? So, so let me run with that as an, a concrete example and I'll touch upon yeah. some of your questions. Um, just to put my language on the table because mm. I think language is important. Um, I, we wouldn't think about demonstrations. Mm. Uh, demonstration as a term for me implies that I want to demonstrate something. Yeah. What we're actually doing is we're, we're, 
we're launching a new business. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if I'm a, a, a new business mm -hmm. and I'm launching a product, mm -hmm. my first phone is not a demonstration. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually a new product. Okay. So, so yes, we want to demonstrate yeah. <laughs> that a, a new product is possible, and we do that by actually mm -hmm. creating a market. Mm -hmm. So we're actually creating a market that doesn't exist. That's, that's what we're doing. Um, and um, actually, the work that goes on is about really being deeply involved in the design process, mm -hmm. which is not an advisory role, mm -hmm. but it's actually being embedded in that, helping make different disciplines mm -hmm. work together on this issue, understanding what are the things that are driving the investment side mm -hmm. of this, and why are the developers always talking mm -hmm. about costs mm -hmm. when they should be talking about investment, mm -hmm. Oh, if I put this kind of window, it's going to cost me more. Mm. And I say, yeah, but you're going to save on your energy bill, which will cost less. Mm. So think of it as an investment, mm. right? You begin to realize mm. what are the dominant cultures of mm. the concepts, models mm. that they have, and you begin to understand how they need to be reshaped to mm. make this other stuff happen. You begin to prototype stuff. We did a lot of co-creation mm. with potential mm. future inhabitants mm. about what kind of housing do they want. Because we all realize people don't buy apartments because of the concrete in them. People mm. buy it because of uh, location, mm. they buy it because of the park across the street, the services, the schools, uh, many other attributes mm. that go beyond that. What are the new trade-offs? Because it's always a question mm. of trade-offs, if you mm. want to use that word, that happen. Mm. Uh, and we were told by the developers that they knew the market, mm. because the market's buying mm. the one and only mm. product that's available, mm. so it's hard to know mm. what the else they mm. would buy. So you co-create and you actually create new knowledge mm. on a table. And in a very kind of hands-on approach, you begin to put, change the investment logic, mm. show how they can make profit, mm. uh, show actually what might sell, mm. what the shape of that is, what are the energy implications, and put that mm. all together. Now, at the end of the day, I would say, and others m would deeply disagree in my organization, mm. but I think we failed mm. because we decided uh, to divest from this project. Mm. Um, and now our developers are taking that mission on, but mm. I wonder whether uh, developers that are in business as usual can get out of their normal mode without another entity like ourselves mm. that is also investing and helping take some of the risk out. Because mm. ultimately, as I began mm. my monologue, was mm. by saying that we're creating a market. Mm. There is no market, mm. and so how do you create a market? And I think that's part of government's mm. role, mm. is actually to create these new markets by actually doing stuff. Mm. So to answer your, uh, one last thing that mm. you mentioned, which is very important, so how do you go beyond the city block? Because mm. we talked about development in Finland. Well, you need to think about carbon, as I mm. said, from many perspectives, and one is embodied energy. Mm. So up until now, we only mm. built out of concrete in mm. Finland, in which it has a big, big concrete footprint. The reason is we have fire codes in place and, and building codes that prevent the use of wood. In Sweden, for 20 years, they've used wood mm. in buildings. And the example I always say is you have the same technical data, mm. you have basically same climate zone, same societies, mm. and one group's telling me mm. wood burns and the other one says mm. doesn't. So these aren't technical questions, these are deeply cultural. Mm. We are very risk mm. adverse and the Swedes see opportunity where we see risk. Mm. You need to change that mm. logic. So we changed, along with many other people, two years ago, the building codes. Mm. And now you can use wood. That has a huge impact on the carbon footprint mm. of any building in Finland, mm. a systemic effect has huge impact on the wood industry mm. that is dying right now. And when you get cities like Helsinki and other mm. cities to realize that creating a new market and behaving differently is not as risky and is mm. actually quite rewarding, mm. they're more likely to continue those practices mm. going forward. But they're not necessarily able mm. or even have the role to initiate those new mm. kinds of risk-taking endeavors. Okay, so that's really interesting. Yeah, let's have a question at the back. And then we'll come here. Hugh, Hugh Lloyd. Uh, Marco, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of what you were describing, some of the language you were using, uh, the importance of things like perspective, uh, sort of speak of systems thinking. Um, in this country, we perhaps have two contested issues that might make what you do harder. One is that systems thinking isn't particularly prevalent in how we do government, uh, whether local or national. Uh, and the second, which may make it even worse, is the role of the state is contested. So how would you, given those two issues, you know, if you were to help us take this forward, what would you suggest we might need to do? It's a very, very good question. So I'll, I'll give you, or, or do we want to grab? Uh, we can grab this question yeah, next, yeah. yeah. Sorry, so I'll, I'll come back in a second. Okay. Hi, Marco. Uh, Hi. My name's Matthew Mezzo. I'm from the RSA. Uh, interestingly enough, I also wanted to say something about systems thinking, because mm -hmm. that's what struck me. You were talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the systemic nature of the problems, the interrelationships. 
And that reminded me of a pamphlet that was done for Demos a few years ago by a chap mm. called uh, Professor Jake Chapman, and it was all about mm. you know how that kind of thinking mm. was lacking, how command and control doesn't mm. work very well. And uh, he, what he said is that across Whitehall, people loved mm. it. He was asked to speak everywhere, mm. and you know it was fantastic. Mm. He thought everyone was going to be taking this stuff mm. forward, you know, innovating. But then he looked, you know, a bit later, and he noticed no one was willing to, to mm. try anything new. Mm. And obviously, he kind of, uh, well, no, not no one, a few people tried things, and he. Um, when he actually tried to get to the bottom of what the factor was, he, he kind of found that it was the kind of, um, what do you call it, the kind of action logics or mentalities in the civil service, mm -hmm. the kind of achiever one, the expert one, they just don't really want to take those kind of risks, be that vulnerable. It was only people with an action logic he called the, um, the strategist, which is, I don't know, what, four or five percent of, of leaders who are the kind of people that are willing to be that vulnerable and try things. Those are the ones he worked with who would try things, and, and that was the kind of factor, this kind of leadership maturity factor that, that made the difference. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yes, uh, I interesting question, and, and I don't have a clear answer, but I have some thoughts on this. Um, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily just a question of get more people to understand, and like with design in many words, like actually with all words, I always hesitate, <laughs> because they come with baggage, mm -hmm. so when you talk about systems thinking, I'm, you know, I'm thinking Vietnam War and, and, mm. and you know, uh, a Greenspan. You know, there, there's a lot of people who actually would claim that there was a lot of systems thinking going on. It was just maybe applied the wrong way. But I think we have a shared understanding of what we mean is the ability to kind of connect and see the bigger picture is that kind of what we're talking about. But I don't think it's just a question of, well, we need more people who, you know, can do that work. Uh, because I don't think sort of, um, let's say, uh, new markets, new uh, cultures, new industries are born just through one thing. Like the sea is not just about plankton. There's plankton, there's shrimp, there's, and it's actually the, the interaction between them that creates marine life. So what we need is a space, I think, where we can be freed by all the pressures that are in a way creating the need to going not thinking systems, right? And so in here, I think, is the question about how do we do that? And the, qu the term lab is one debate to be had around that. Uh, there's a question of incentives, right, which is tied to the space. So as you said, like at Harvard, yeah, you know, Harvard wants to take on the big challenges of today, but the incentive structure is not there to make it happen. So it's happening in spite of the institution. So it goes back to that. And like, I don't know, just take any industry, too as a kind of analogy. It's not like we're going to have more buildings or better buildings by having more architects. Mm. Uh, you need to have uh, people who develop, you need investors that understand, you need online clients, you need uh, uh, product manufacturers and so on. Mm. All that work together and understand and share how this community works together. So it's, it's, a, it's a coordinated set of things that, that needs to happen. You need to have a large base of people, who, uh, probably everybody, if you want to bring systems thinking, who have a uh, an awareness that this is something valuable. You create the incentives, the space for that. Some that have an understanding, people who are doing procurement understand that I need to connect these things when I'm procuring. And you probably need a small bunch of people who have the ability to then actually do that kind of work. The same way that I don't think every place has, you know, an economist by some definitions would be sort of systems thinkers. Um, but, you know, I think most economic debate has become more about just financial uh, and not really economics. So Moka, I'm very intrigued. You put up this list of, uh, of big challenges and the big mm -hmm. word crisis with an exclamation mark. Um, and at the same time, you told us that you sort of started to innovate this sort of space where people come together and start producing some solutions, but also that you've now decided that you're going to move on to the next thing. So I'm quite intrigued as to actually why you're sort of now morphing into the next, uh, next phase of whatever is going on in Citra, and what does that begin to look like, and why have you decided the time has come to, to move on and close the design lab? Well, uh, that comes out of the decision of the design mm. team to move forward, yeah. and there are um, just even just personal yeah. things associated which I won't bore mm. you with, but uh, the, the more important thing is the realization that we've come to a kind of um, end mm. in terms of that development mm. um, and, and to take that forward, going mm. forward. Um, you know, we could keep doing this and mm. we never started out doing this work to mm. set up 
an institution or a setup, something that mm. would be there forever. Mm. I think it's matured to a certain point. Mm. I think we also have as a team a desire to actually mm. go further and we feel that the best way to do that is actually to go beyond the walls of mm. our organization. What that mm -hmm. will actually mean, um, I don't know, um, but in the ethos of working on projects, I'm now more interested in how do you make the kinds of projects that need to happen, happen, mm -hmm. and, and less worrying about organizations and that kind of stuff. But do you I think know. the people who've, enc who've encountered the sort of design lab uh, experience, if you might put it, within government are actually now thinking about the way in which they tackle issues Absolutely. differently. Absolutely. So just to give you an example, the gentleman who said, I can't believe you did it in a week. Yeah. Uh, so we, we had some ideas. Okay, this, this is what we think, I don't know, education should look like. And these are the things you need to do. Okay, most of the, that stuff didn't happen. Uh, well, but the lab wasn't, and the whole initiative of Helsinki Design Lab, it, it wasn't set out to actually deliver on actual things. It was actually to create new learnings. Uh, you know, mm. if, you're, if you've never designed an airplane, mm. like it's the, the first day somebody's trying to fly, then you set mm. up an environment where you can understand mm. the principles of aerodynamics and so on, and so you can start mm. building better airplanes mm. where they build airplanes. Mm. It's, that's the kind of mm. analogy for it. So while we had some ideas about what could happen as projects, mm. the realization of, oh my God, you did this in a week, I need more of that mm. where I work mm. was basically mm. the call, G gave us the kind of mandate to set up the exchange program mm. to say, okay, fine. Mm. So we had to pivot. Mm. While the lab was setting out, this is the strategy, we need to answer a question that yeah. came before that. Mm. We don't even have the capability to do this. So, okay, let's do this mm. other project that comes out. So you, a lot of people say, well, you know, how, how do you look at outcomes and that mm. kind of stuff? Well, sometimes when you're in early phase, fuzzy, mm. front up stuff, it's very difficult. Mm. And I think you need to be comfortable to say, for maybe that stuff, we think about outcomes in a very different way mm. than I'm a, a phone manufacturer that knows the market and the market's mm. well understood mm. and I, can, I know how to determine what outcomes are. Mm. That's not to say that there isn't responsibility for what you do. Okay, is there one last question for Marco? Because I want to wind this up. Yeah, one question. Actually, well, go ahead, we've got two last questions. So we have two very, very quick because I want everything to, to finish by two o'clock. Um, can you just um, give some um, background to the sort of long vision of uh, the Finnish government? Because in the UK, the governments have quite, I mean, they're in power for five years. They're actually talking about the next election two years into their, uh, their, their um, governance. So would you say in Finland they have a long view in terms of taking on these challenges or is it a sort of political football? Okay. Great. Okay. And one quick question, uh, Carl Allen. Is I occasionally teach young people, is 16 too young to start talking about these things? Because we just keep talking to a relatively older generation, and I'm thinking we should be talking about these mm -hmm. things to a younger generation. Okay, okay, so how do you get the love? They're actually both facets of the sort of long term question yeah. here. So, so again, I'm going to offend most people <laughs> that I know. Um, I, I think the problems you have in the UK um, are the similar ones that we have in Finland. I grew up in Italy, they're the same ones there. They all exhibit different symptoms. So what looks like a cold in Finland and what looks like a rash here is basically the same allergy, right? Um, and I don't think there is actually any long-term vision. Actually, I think there's a complete in, uh, lack of ability to actually understand how you build visions that create value. And that, that was my argument. That I think politicians, our relationship to politicians needs to change. Um, you know, many people have talked about this, but we keep them very accountable to what they say. But what they say, they may not know what's going to work. And we have to deal with it. We have to have a come on like a different social contract with them. So there, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that I think needs to change. And I think we need chief design officers to help, say, uh, politicians understand how do you find the right simplifiers today. Uh, in terms of education, absolutely. I think, you know, we teach kids things we think are valuable. Uh, maths uh, to speak, you know, these are pretty valuable things to know. And so I think we need to think about what are the skills that are going to make your community competitive, uh, thrive in the future. And I'm not saying we need to teach this stuff the same way we don't teach necessarily, I don't know, nuclear physics to 16 year olds. But we do teach some of the building blocks that allow them to understand nuclear physics later on. And what are those? 
And I think there are questions about uh, empathy, which I think are going to be really, really important. I think communities that have greater empathy are the ones that are probably likely to find solutions in a world that is resource constrained. Uh, the ability to improvise, uh, non-linear thinking, whatever, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff you could sort of put out there. So I think that's a very valuable project to do, to figure out. My concern is by the time those people are in positions where they can impact change, we've locked into the wrong solution. So there are two projects we need to do simultaneously. Uh, some very severe brainwashing uh, <laughs> and some fantastically gentle cultivation. Okay. Mark, that's a fantastic point to end. Great. So could you all thank Marco for well, thank you. time thank you. And thank you all very much for coming to the Institute for Government. If you're interested in staying in touch with us and would like to drop your business card in at our front desk, then that would be very helpful to us. Um, so thank you all very much, and I hope you enjoyed your uh, visit here, particularly if it was your first time.